Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter 10, <clears throat> excuse me, which is on the water-soluble vitamins, which are all of your B vitamins and vitamin C. We're beginning a unit where we cover all the vitamins and minerals, so we'll cover the water-soluble vitamins uh, first, then the fat-soluble vitamins, then we'll cover what are called the major minerals and the trace minerals, but we'll go into more detail with those later. But uh, uh, remember that from what we learned in chapter one, that vitamins are organic, and that doesn't mean you buy them in a farmer's market. That means that they have they have carbon. Their structures are built around a carbon skeleton, whereas minerals are inorganic. So that's one of the main differences between vitamins and minerals. They both kind of have similar functions in the body anyhow. And then the water-soluble vitamins, like the name implies, are soluble in water. So they can be carried in water, and uh, uh, the good news there is they're they're absorbed and transported very easily. The bad news is any excess in, in almost every case just enters your urine and you lose them. So if you have, so it's, so you really can't store almost all of your water soluble vitamins. If you consume more vitamin C than you need this morning, the rest will just be kind of passed through you. Uh, B12 is, a is an exception. B12 is a water soluble vitamin, but up to five years worth of it, depending on who you ask, can be stored in the liver. So water-soluble vitamins are, are absorbed and transported very easily because they can be dissolved right in the watery plasma of your blood. But the downside is excess is lost in your urine. So these, um, you don't really have to worry about toxicity because levels don't build up to too high. If you, if you consume too much vitamin C, unless you reach just ridiculous numbers, it shouldn't hurt you. But the downside is they need to be consumed on a very regular basis because you can't store the excess. So you, you know, even talking about something like vitamin C, let's say you take a thousand milligrams of vitamin C for a day, or a day for some reason, I'm not saying you should or, or why you do that, but let's say you are. Um, you'd be better off taking 250 milligrams four times a day or at least 500 milligrams twice a day than you would 1,000 milligrams once a day. All right, um, that's just kind of some of the basics about the water soluble vitamins. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into much more detail. Let's, so let's go ahead and get started. Also, as we're going through the list of individual, individual nutrients, I am going to be calling on a couple of documents I have sitting here in the classroom or in the course shell. I have um, this is a, a document from the FDA about the vitamins and minerals. So there's, I have a couple things I like to say from there, and then I have my own document that um, that I put together. So I just want to make sure that uh, we have all of the the key stuff in one place as we're going through this video. So I will be kind of bouncing off the PowerPoint a little bit, just so you know. Okay, the icebreaker. I like this one. What is the role of vitamins in keeping you healthy? So you know, we say the same thing about minerals, but what do vitamins do, right? We all know we need vitamins. We all, we all know that we should be consuming foods that are rich in vitamins or supplementing with vitamins, these types of things, but why? What do they actually do? Um, what foods are best in delivering vitamins? Do you take extra vitamins when you feel run down or as though you are getting sick? Why or why not? So all these are great questions. <laughs> Excuse me. So early in the morning when I start these. My throat's not ready. <clears throat> what is the role of vitamins in keeping you healthy? So the key thing here is vitamins do not provide energy. They're not worth any calories, right? When, you, when someone talks about B vitamins, they often talk about them as the energy vitamins. And I think that's how I would describe them as a group as well. But they don't actually provide any energy. So vit vitamins... Um, power the processes that allow us to use our macronutrients. So the reason that B vitamins are considered energy vitamins is because almost every step in the metabolic pathways that allow you to turn carbohydrates, lipids, proteins into energy rely on B vitamins. You know, so we'll, we'll cover the examples as we go through. So the best analogy that I have for this is imagine a house, right? So your house, the, the foundation is the concrete, right? And you've got the, and you've got the, the boards that make up the walls and things like that. Well, so those really big structures that the majority of your house are made of, so wood, um, drywall, I'm not, a, I'm not a carpenter, wood, drywall, concrete, right? The, the, the huge majority of your house would be your macronutrients, like your carbs and lipids and your proteins. So how do vitamins and minerals function? They're going to be like the nails and the screws or whatever else you're holding things together with, right? So, so your, your, your vitamins would be like the nails and screws that are holding all those things together. So they're not a huge part of the house by weight or by volume, but, you, but your house wouldn't function without them, right? If you remove vitamins, remove minerals, you will die. I mean, the, the essential vitamins and minerals are, they're, they're called that because um, a, a, a true enough deficiency can, can lead to death. So, um, so that's kind of how I like to look at them. So that, you know, the, the carbs and lipids and proteins do most of the work, but they couldn't do their job without things like vitamins. All right, what foods are best in delivering vitamins? This is where we talk a lot about bioavailability. So how you cook and prepare your foods matter, the type of foods matter. Um, you know, mo overall, um, I believe in getting vitamins in, in, their, in its 
preform state, meaning getting vitamins that are in the form that your body needs them. So for example, um, you've got, you can consume beta carotene or you can consume vitamin A because beta carotene is a, is a precursor to vitamin A and beta carotene can be converted to vitamin A. But genetic studies have shown that some people have deficiencies that make that very difficult, maybe 30 plus percent of people. So are you better off getting beta carotene and then asking your body to turn it into vitamin A or consuming vitamin A? My personal opinion is you're better off consuming the vitamin A directly. So that, that one of the, this is one of the benefits of consuming animal products. Animal products generally have the nutrients that are in the same form that we need them because we're a lot more similar to an animal than we are to a plant. So we don't really use beta carotene, right? We can eat it, but we need to turn it into something else. Just like when you consume the essential fatty acids, your body still has to um, turn, like let's say you eat flax seeds to get the essential fatty acids. Um, your body has to convert that ALA into EPA and into DHA, and that conversion is pretty poor. So I think you're better off consuming fish or getting fish oil and getting that right in the, in the best format. So, so this is what, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. If you're looking at nutrient-dense foods, I'm a big fan of um, organ meats and seafoods and the, because these are, you're going to get the vitamins in the form that your body needs them. But if you nothing wrong with getting vitamins from plants, it's just you have to understand that plants have compounds called anti-nutrients that can actually impair digestion and absorption of some, some nutrients. Um, and you, you probably will need more because you're, you're getting them in a less bioavailable state. Another, you know, again, this is not a vitamin, but look at something like iron, right? The iron in, you know, the heme iron that's in meat is absorbed um, much better than the non-heme iron that's in plant foods. So you can get all the iron you need from plant foods. You just need to get more of it. So, so the less bioavailable a nutrient is, the more of it you need to consume because that you're, you're digesting and absorbing and actually getting to use a smaller percent of it. So back to that question, what foods are best in delivering vitamins? You wanna find foods that are nutrient dense, that have a lot of vitamins, and you want to make sure they're prepared, and we'll talk about this too, but you wanna make sure they're prepared in a way where you're not destroying the nutrients, but also prepared in a way where you're releasing the nutrients. So things like um, fermentation is, is a good way to actually release nutrients. Like if you take, if you take a head of cabbage and turn it into sauerkraut, that sauerkraut's gonna have maybe 10 times more vitamin C in it than the, than the cabbage did. And part of that is because you're getting it from the microbes that did the fermentation directly. So kind of cool stuff. All right, do you take extra vitamins when you feel run down or as though you were getting sick? So that's a question, it's asking you that question, but, but I'll tell you my answer. We have something we call the cocktail here in the house, and this is not medical advice, but if someone feels like they're getting sick or someone is sick, um, the rest of us will, well, the person that's sick as well, but the rest of us, if we're trying to worry about, if we're worrying about prevention, will increase our intake in a few nutrients. So this, uh, the cocktail that we use has some vitamin C in it. It has vitamin D in it, um, vitamin A, because I think those are, those are the three key vitamins when it comes to immunity. There's also lysine, which is an amino acid that, that does appear to have some antiviral properties and zinc. I think zinc is very important uh, when, when you're sick. So that's kind of our cocktail. Again, not, not medical advice, not telling you to do that. But the answer for me to this question is yes. When, when if, we, if we feel like we're getting sick or someone is sick, we will increase our uh, intake of those nutrients there. So why or why not? I, I just explained why. Trying to just you know stimulate the immune system a little bit, give it a little tiny boost. And I don't think these things are miracles, but give it a tiny boost for, for a few days uh, to, to hopefully keep you from getting sick or keep you from being sick as long. So if you have a different answer, uh, feel free to share. <clears throat> all right. So what are our learning objectives here for chapter 10? Remember, we're not covering all the vitamins here, just the water soluble vitamins. Describe how vitamins differ from the energy nutrients, which would be your carbs, lipids, and proteins, and how fat soluble vitamins differ from water soluble vitamins. So we've covered, we talked about the water soluble vitamins. We'll come back and talk about the fat soluble ones. Identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for each of the B vitamins. So you'll leave here with kind of a checklist of the, of the foods you should be eating if, you, if you're not getting enough of these nutrients. And, and of course, you wouldn't know that unless you were tracking your diet. I mean, that's why I like uh, the chronometer and my fitness pal. You should be tracking your diet, and just even for a few days. And if it looks like your diet is deficient in a certain nutrient, then come back to this PowerPoint, come back to these things, and see where can I get a few foods to, boot, to bump up my intake. And then identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for vitamin C, which is the other water-soluble vitamin. Um, what else about that? Just in general, I think vitamins and minerals are very important. 
But I've always believed that if you get the macronutrients under control, then these things become um, a little less important. What I mean by that is if you focus on eating the highest quality carbohydrates you can find, the highest quality fats you can find, and the highest quality proteins you can find, chances are you're, you're taking care of most of the vitamins and minerals. Now, there are some nutrients, and I'll highlight them as we, get, as we go through. There are some nutrients that even on a really healthy diet, you may not be getting enough of. You know, things like iodine and magnesium. Whenever we bump into one of those, I'll explain why someone eating a really healthy diet still might not be getting enough. And then, so we'll kind of highlight that. But I think generally speaking, if you're eating a really good quality diet uh, with a lot of whole foods, then your risk of nutrient deficiency is pretty low. Uh, unless you're, unless you're, you don't meet all those pillars we talked about with meal planning, like uh, there's no variety in your diet. So you're always getting the same nutrients, but not getting others. So we'll look at that. And then the idea of a supplement, right? So should you supplement with vitamins or not? I, mean, I just told you a, a time when we do. But again, I'm not saying we don't take vitamin A pills every day or zinc tablets every day. This is a few days a year. Um, we kind of we bump up our intake of these things. So I think that, like the name implies, a supplement is a supplement. It should supplement a healthy diet. Vitamins won't make up for a crappy diet, right? We talked about that um, a little bit with um, fiber supplementation. Right? Remember I said that um, if, you, you know, if you have a poor diet and you supplement with fiber, um, you could actually be making things worse because you could be, um, you'll be absorbing even less of the minerals in your diet because the fiber is gonna be pulling it through your body. But if you're eating a high fiber diet with a lot of whole foods in it, yes, you're gonna lose some of those minerals from your food, but you're eating so many more because you're eating healthy foods that you're not creating a deficiency. So there are situations like that where, where supplementing a poor diet can be almost worse for you than not doing it at all. So just, re just remember that um, really, really focus on quality foods and whole foods and, and avoiding foods that have a bunch of empty calories. And chances are you're going to be meeting most of your nutrient needs. That'll get you 90, 95% of the way there. And then look at your diet, track it using something like the chronometer app or, or website and see, okay, here's a couple nutrients I need to try to find a little more of and, and bump up that intake. <laughs> Okay, an overview of the vitamins. <clears throat> so they support nutritional health. And the main reason we need them, like I, I told you that they kind of, they function as the, the nails and screws holding this home together. Uh, so they're critically important, even though you don't need a lot of them, right? You need, you need uh, mi you know, grams or really milligrams or micrograms of the vitamins and minerals, whereas you need uh, grams of the macronutrients. Uh, they, they primarily function as coenzymes. They, they primarily function as as the ignition for your enzymes. So enzymes are made of protein, and we know that enzymes are super important. They power almost every metabolic reaction in your entire body. I mean, we would not be here without, without the enzymes that support our metabolism. But those enzymes are like a car that doesn't have, that doesn't have an ignition. <clears throat> the, the vitamins, <clears throat> excuse me, vitamins and minerals, especially vitamins, function as the, as the ignition that turn on the enzymes so that they can power our metabolism. So you would not have a metabolism without enzymes, and you are not alive without a metabolism. All right, um, differences from energy yielding nutrients. I've mentioned this, but just remember that um, <clears throat> your macronutrients, they provide the energy. They have, that's why there's four calories in a gram of carbs, four calories in a gram of protein, nine calories in a gram of fat, because they're the, they're the nutrients that we actually extract energy from. Vitamins and minerals don't provide energy directly, right? You take a B-complex pill, it doesn't have any calories in it because vitamin, uh, B, B vitamins don't have any, any energy, but it, they allow us to extract energy from our macronutrients. So structurally, how are they different? Um, you see that they're individual units. So a protein is gonna be a chain of amino acids. A, uh, a triglyceride is gonna have these long fatty acid tails that are chains of carbons. And then carbohydrate, carbohydrates are gonna be chains of your monosaccharides like glucose. Whereas your vitamins are just individual units. So there's nothing, there's nothing to tear apart, nothing to break down, which is why they don't yield any energy. So we talked about no energy yielded. Um, food contents, again, that's going to be different. The main thing I would look at, you know, with uh, generally speaking, the vitamin and mineral content of food is it has started to drop uh, and, and mainly with minerals. I think minerals is a whole separate story because minerals can't be created, right? The, the plants, the, the plants and animals that you consume, they can generate, they can make vitamins. They don't make minerals. Minerals come from the soil. So really um, when, when we garden and, and I'm all for soil health and, and good agriculture, uh, a, a plants, plants can really only be as healthy as the soil that they're grown in, and then animals can really only be as healthy as the plants they consume. So that's so that's very, very true, but more, more so with minerals than vitamins. All right, and then what similarities do they have with energy yielding nutrients? I mean, we talked about they're organic, so they, they, they are built around carbon, they just don't have, they're not long chains of carbons. 
All right, bioavailability, and we still haven't talked about the fat cell vitamins. We'll come back to that. But So what's this term here? Bioavailability. You'll see, you'll see it a lot when you're talking about vitamins and minerals. The rate and the extent to which a nutrient is absorbed and used. So let's say that if the bioavailability of, of a nutrient is 90%, then that means that you know 90% of what you put in your mouth will be digested and absorbed and used. If the bioavailability is 50%, it's going to be a lot lower. So a real good example, uh, let's say like calcium. So like the cal calcium that you'd find in a container of yogurt is going to be uh, very bioavailable. So the still not all of it, but let's say that you know the majority of the calcium in a container of yogurt you are going to digest, absorb, and use. Um, the 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 calcium in spinach not the case because spinach has these anti-nutrients like oxalates that m decrease bioavailability. So there's there's about as much calcium in a serving of spinach as there is in a serving of yogurt, but you're only going to be able to digest and absorb and use about 5% of it, so a small fraction. So that means that the calcium in spinach is not bioavailable, the calcium in dairy products is. Um, and that's that's kind of an exception. There are, there are plenty of plants where you can get calcium from, but that's just a really good example. So what else could influence uh, bioavailability? Let's look at the list here and then talk about a few more things. Influenced by the efficiency of digestion. So again, it doesn't matter what you, you, you're not what you eat, you're what you absorb. So if you, if you eat something that can't be digested properly, then it can't be absorbed. And if it can't be absorbed, you can't use it. Uh, and that's where cooking comes into play, right? So cooking, uh, so you see preparation on the, the last part of the list. Um, cooking does destroy some nutrients, but it also makes other nutrients more available. So, so I think the net change is good. So cooking your food as a species, when we started to harness the power of fire and cook our food, um, it made our food more bioavailable. It made the nutrients in our food more bio bioavailable and it's been, a, it's been a net positive. So preparing your food, so if you prepare your food properly, yes, you will destroy some nutrients, but the nutrients that are left behind are going to be more bioavailable. So there are some exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, that's the case. So if you, uh, let's see, like carrots, right? When you cook carrots, you release more beta carotene than if you eat them raw. So nothing against eating carrots raw, but um, the prep preparation does matter. But then at the same time, you want to make sure you're not destroying your nutrients when you prepare your foods. So um, more gentle preparation methods, like lightly sauteing vegetables, would be better than, um, than, than certain cooking methods. If you're going to boil or you steam vegetables, then one thing you can do is actually you will lose a lot of nutrients in the water. So one thing you can do if you steam your vegetables is don't throw that water out. Right, you could either you could drink that water, or you could use that water as like a base for um, soups or stews. And then the nutrients that actually were leached out of the broccoli, for example, would still be in that liquid. So you could still you could still um, get them. All right, um, and then the one in the middle we we skipped previous nutrient intake and nutri nutrition status. Remember, your body is always trying to maintain homeostasis. So the, the more deficient you are in a nutrient, the higher percent of it you will absorb. If you're constantly consuming calcium, your body will decrease the absorption of calcium so you don't get too much. But if you're never consuming something like iron, your body will upregulate uh, the, the absorption of iron. So all those are true. All right, synthetic and fortified foods influence bioavailability. So let's look at it like an example would be like a calcium fortified orange juice, for example. So if they were to put if they were to put a, a less bioavailable form of calcium like calcium carbonate in there, then um, it wouldn't be very bioavailable. But the the calcium fortified orange juices I've seen they use a, a more bioavailable form um, called calcium citrate malate I believe, and um, so that the calcium in a calcium fortified orange juice is basically as bioavailable as the calcium from a glass of milk. So that so that the nutrients that go into the foods matter a lot. You see, like a lot of your breakfast cereals have a whole bunch of of nutrients added to them. Well, they're really only as good, no matter what they say on the side of the box about having 100% of a certain vitamin, they're only as good as how um, bioavailable that form is. All right, so that's the basics of bioavailability, and you're not what you eat, you're what you, you absorb. Uh, precursors. So precursors are substances that are converted to an active form of the vitamin. So the best example of that I've already mentioned, we have beta carotene. Beta carotene is not essential. Beta carotene is not a vitamin. Uh, beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. So that, that's what a precursor would be, something that's kind of one step away or something that is converted to an active form. Uh, the organic, organic nature, fresh foods, 
naturally contain vitamins so that they can be readily destroyed during processing. So again, how you process and how you prepare foods matters. Uh, let's see, one, one example would be like, you know how you, a lot of your produce is frozen. Well, that, that freezing process, you might lose about a quarter of the nutrients that are, that are, that are in, the, in that bag of peas or whatever. But it does preserve the rest of those nutrients very well. So, so you, you buy those peas, you store those peas, and then a month later you eat those peas. You, you had that initial loss, but it preserved the rest. Whereas um, when foods are sitting out, so let's say you, you, you go to the store and you, see, and you see some peas in the produce aisle. Every day they've been sitting there, every, every minute that they've been off of the vine, so to speak, um, they have been lose, losing nutritional quality. So some studies have shown that if you let, like let's say a head of spinach sit out or let, let, a, let a bowl of spinach sit out for a few days before you consume it, it might have lost 30 or 40% of its nutritional value. So, so, so you see, you got to kind of matter, you know, these processing methods do matter. Um, the fresher, the better. That's one of the reasons I like gardens, right? We literally, we literally, we have hydroponic gardens in the house. So we will, we will cut our vegetables and put them in our mouths, right? So they were, so there, so there wasn't any time for them to be, to, for them to lose that nutritional value. So kind of a cool thing. All right. So all this stuff matters, but don't overthink it. If you're eating a bunch of whole foods and eating a bunch of healthy foods, yes, you're going to be losing some nutritional value by um, sauteing your vegetables a, a little bit, but um, you also made some other ones more bioavailable, and there's usually plenty to go around. All right, so dose level and effects when it comes to toxicity. So we mentioned earlier that water-soluble vitamins aren't really aren't stored so toxicity is not generally a big deal because excess is lost in urine. This will be a bigger conversation when we talk about the fat soluble vitamins because they are stored. With, um, with water soluble vitamins, since, that, since you lose the excess, I'd say deficiencies are more common, like making sure that you have to have a constant supply of them since there's nowhere to store most of them. But toxicity, um, so you see here, just uh, kind of like the dose makes the poison, as they say. On the left here, as you progress in the direction of more, the effect gets better and better with no end in sight. Um, real life is seldom if ever like this. So in, in a, in, what that is saying, in, in, in a fictitious world, then more would be better. Like how much vitamin C should you consume? As much as possible. How, how many fish oil pills should you take a day? As much as possible. That's not true. Um, the second one, as you progress in the direction of more, the effect reaches a maximum and then a plateau, becoming no better with higher doses. So this would be something where, especially with the water cell vitamins, yes, you reach a point where you, you're making sure you're getting an optimal intake. Anything above that is really just making your urine more expensive so that the excess would be lost. But even then, there's a limit to that. Like vitamin C, yes, the excess you, you lose in urine. But man, if you start getting over three grams a day, you start to see some problems. So I would say with water soluble vitamins, this might be true in most cases, except there is an extreme. There is a point where that's no longer the case. Then on the far right, we see what's called a bell curve. This is almost always what we look at when we're talking about nutrition, right? Not having enough of something is bad, but having too much of something is also bad. You want to find that happy medium. Now that, that you see that bell curve there, on the far left side, we'd probably have the RDA, where you're making sure you're getting enough to not be deficient. On the far right side, we'd have the up the UL, the tolerable upper intake level before before things become toxic. Somewhere in the middle is the optimal intake, and that's where it gets really tricky because we don't know what that number is. We know what the floor is, we know what the ceiling is, we don't know what the optimal intake for you for that nutrient is, but it's somewhere in between those two extremes. All right, as you progress in the direction of more, the effect reaches an optimum at some intermediate dose. That'd be our optimal intake level and then declines, showing that more is better up to a point and increasingly harmful beyond that point. That too much can be as harmful as too little is true for most nutrients. So that, that's, that's the stance that I would take for really all nutrients. I was just saying that with your water soluble vitamins, if you, eat, if you consume too much, um, thankfully most of it's just gonna be lost in your urine anyways. All right, so match these, and you can pause this if you want to. Uh, effects absorption, transport, storage, and excretion, that'd be solubility, so how easily something is carried through your gut and carried into your bloodstream, etc. Readily destroyed things, you know, organic things, again, organic meaning carbon-based structures, not, um, not uh, farmer's market. So, this, so vitamins are, are, are going to be destroyed in ways that minerals aren't, right? For minerals, the key is, were the minerals ever there? Because they had to be from the soil. So if you, if you grow food in nutritious, nutrient-dense, mineral-rich soil, there's going to be plenty of minerals. And then, then the key is unlocking them and making them bioavailable. But vitamins can be destroyed by cooking and processing methods. Inactive forms that are converted to active forms, those are your precursors, beta-carotene being the best example. 
Oh, they give it to you right next there. Example, beta carotene being a precursor. And then adverse effects in high doses use the UL. That Remember, the UL is one of our DRIs from an earlier chapter, the tolerable upper intake level. So if you go above that number, you can, become, you can develop toxicities. All right, so there are two kinds of solubility, fat and water soluble. More is better is not the case. Excessive intake of vitamins from supplements may be harmful. And that's generally where you see toxicity. It's, it's, it's hard to eat a diet that becomes toxic, but with supplements, you absolutely can consume too much of things, right? People, you know, you're, you're just getting uh, supra physiological or unnatural doses if you use supplementation. Like how could you eat that much of that nutrient? Well, you can't, but you can easily do it in supplement form. Okay, so we haven't talked about fat soluble enough. We have a whole chapter coming up, but we talked about, so solubility, water soluble vitamins, they're digested, they're absorbed, you know, they're right there in the water of the watery, the six or seven liters of fluid that are in your gut today. They're going to be absorbed right into your bloodstream and carried through your blood to where they're needed. So those are your water soluble vitamins. Very easy to uh, absorb and transport, but then excess just spills over into the urine and not all of it is going to be recaptured, so we lose excess in our urine. Fat soluble vitamins are different. So fat soluble vitamins are digested and absorbed with fat. And remember fat, like long chain fats, they're gonna be absorbed into your lymphatic system, not your bloodstream. So first of all, if there's fat soluble vitamins in a meal, there has to be fat in that meal for you to absorb it. So like I think of an example, like not to put shame on anyone, anything, but like uh, Total, like Total has those cereals where they say Total, Raisin Bran, whatever, 100% of all these vitamins and minerals, okay? So there's 100% of the vitamin A in, a in this bowl of total. But if you eat this cereal, which doesn't have fat in it, with skim milk, which doesn't have fat in it, then yes, there's vitamin A in that meal, but it will not be absorbed um, and, and be, because you need fat in a, in a meal to absorb the fat soluble vitamins. I think a nice safe number, I, I say that a meal needs to have eight grams of fat in it to properly absorb the fat soluble vitamins. And it's not just fat soluble vitamins. Other things are fat soluble too, like the carotenoids. So like if you had, if you have a salad, for example, if a salad has no fat in it, then you're not going to absorb the beta carotene anywhere near the same level as you would if that meal had fat. So put some nuts on it, put some seeds on it, a little bit of fat in a vinaigrette or something. And now you're going to absorb, let's say 500% um, more of the carotenoids from those, from those plants. So you need fat to absorb fat soluble vitamins. And, and I'm not saying that eight grams a day is a magical number. And it's just a fair number, right? Some would say the number has to be higher, but I don't want to terrify you and tell you you have to eat 20 grams of fat in every meal. I think eight grams is a, is a, is a fine number to shoot for. All right, um, and that's a small number. If you eat three meals a day and only have eight grams of fat in each meal, you're not eating enough fat unless you're on a super low calorie diet, right? Even, even people on low fat diets, the, the AMDR for fat is still you know 20 to 35% of your calories. So 20% so of your calories should be coming from fat no matter what kind of diet you're on. So fat soluble vitamins need fat to be absorbed, digested and absorbed properly. They're going to be carried into your lymphatic system. But then the other big difference is fat soluble vitamins are stored, right? They're, they're stored in your body tissues. So like for example, um, let's say you work as a lifeguard all summer. You're outside, you're, uh, you, know, you have your shirt off a lot, you're exposing a lot of skin. And remember, that's how your body produces vitamin D. So UV light hitting the cholesterol in your skin makes vitamin D. So if you make a whole bunch of vitamin D during the summer, you can go the entire winter, I'm not saying you should do this, but, but some people can go the entire winter without consuming any vitamin D and they'll be fine because they can live on the vitamin D stores that they created during the summer. Or, but with the fat cell vitamins, th this is where like high, occasional high doses work just as well as a bunch of little doses. Whereas with water cell vitamins, that's not true. A high dose, you just lose the excess. So fat cell vitamins, like, like vitamin D supplementation. Me and my family, we do supplement vitamin D. We do it once a week. So once a week, we basically take a, a, a decent sized dose, dose and we, we take it with a, a fattier meal and we absorb it and then we kind of live off it for the next, for the next week. Um, same thing. So again, I'm a big fan of organ meats and like, for example, liver is, liver is probably the best source of vitamin A on the planet. Um, so, but I don't recommend eating liver every day. I think you can actually eat too much liver. Right? I, I recommend you never consume more than a pound of liver a week because it's so nutrient dense and it's got so many of these fat soluble vitamins that you could start to see toxicity issues. So I have, you know, like, let's say I have a serving of liver a week and then I live off of those fat soluble vitamins for a few days and then I do, then I repeat. So that's going to be the main differences between fat and water soluble vitamins. Water soluble vitamins are readily absorbed but excess is lost in urine, but they're, and they're not stored, except for, except for B12. Uh, fat cell vitamins need fat to be absorbed, but they're stored, so you don't have to consume them all the time. All right, activity one, we're going to skip this. 
because I can't I can't go through every single nutrient to this detail. <clears throat> We'd be here all day. <clears throat> but um, so the activity is to assign a, a single water soluble vitamin or a single vitamin to a group, and you can answer these kind of questions. But you can find this information real easily. I will. Um, I, I'm going to talk about quite a bit of it as we go through the individual nutrients. I have like the again this FDA document that I that I like to use. So for whatever vitamin you're looking at, if you want to learn about it, what does it do? What are its main functions? We'll cover that today. Explain your vitamin signs of deficiencies and name of deficiency disease. So, so some of them do. We'll talk about things like pellagra and beriberi today. Um, what's the RDA? Which remember the RDA is enough of a nutrient for to meet the needs of 98% of the healthy population. It's not your goal. The RDA is the floor. That is the bare minimum you should be consuming. The optimal intake is going to be higher. Um, list three foods that are good or excellent sources of your vitamin. That's a great thing to know if you're trying to boost your intake. And then is toxicity an issue? Generally is going to be with fat cell vitamins. And then if there is, what is there a tolerable upper intake level? So you can certainly go through that project yourself. All right, this is just, uh, so we've, we've talked about these kind of things quite a bit already. So water cell vitamins, your B vitamins and vitamin C, absorbed into the blood, travel real freely. But the excess, see the kidneys detect and remove excess in the urine. So it is possible to reach toxic levels, but you really have to do it with supplements. You need, we're talking about mega doses. Uh, there are some people that believe in taking 20, 30, 40, 50 grams of vitamin C a day. Um, I've seen, you know, there are some recommendations to basically increase, don't do this, but um, to increase your vitamin C intake until you develop diarrhea and then back off, which means some people are taking 60 or 70 grams of vitamin C a day. You could never do that naturally. Uh, so don't, don't do that. But the requirements are the important parts. The water soluble vitamins, they're needed in frequent frequent doses, one to three times a day, really at every meal, because the excess is, it, you're not storing it for later. You, you, you use it or you lose it. Fat soluble vitamins, they're absorbed with, with long chain fats, so into the lymphatic system, then the blood. They have to be carried because they're, they're not water soluble. They have to be carried by transport proteins or they're carried in your um, lipoproteins like LDL and HDL. Uh, they're stored. So they're stored in the cells associated with fat. So fat cell vitamins are stored with fat. Um, they, they remain in your fat in your fat storage so that you do, you do have dose, you know, basically you're storing them for later. So toxicity is much more common because you are storing them and then you don't need them. Needed in periodic doses, perhaps weeks or even months. So I, so I mentioned every, every week I might get a dose of organ meats and every week I might get, or two weeks I might get a big dose of vitamin D. That's kind of how we do things. All right. Let's go through the B vitamins, finally. So without B vitamins, the body would lack energy. So that's why they're called the energy vitamins. But remember, they do not provide energy directly. They power the, the enzymes that power the metabolic processes that allow you to get energy from your, from your calorie-containing foods, carbs, lipids, and proteins. So they help their, your body use macronutrients for fuel. They are coenzymes. So that's the, you'll see, I'll show you a picture here, but um, um, they, they, they turn on the protein portion of an enzyme to activate it. So without coenzymes, enzymes cannot function. So without B vitamins, you would run out of energy. But it's not because the B vitamins give you energy. It, well, indirectly they do. It's because the enzymes that harvest energy from your food would no longer be functioning. So RDAs and AIs, we cut, we'll, we'll talk about that kind of individually, but um, I have the numbers right here when we get to them. But uh, remember, the RDA is just that floor, the bare minimum. Ad adequate intake is going to be when we can't set an RDI, R RDA. So like vitamin C, we know, we know exactly how much vitamin C a typical person needs to not get scurvy. But some of these nutrients, we can't do that, right? They don't, they, uh, we, we can't set that number. A good example would be, um, well, mainly with the fat cell vitamins, but vitamin K would be a good example because we don't know how much vitamin K you're getting from your gut. So it's hard to say exactly how much you should eat. Uh, vitamin D, great example. We don't know how we don't know where you live. We don't know how much you're outside. Do you wear sunscreen or not? So we don't we don't know how much vitamin D your body's producing. So we can't tell you how much you should be consuming. Okay, vitamins give us energy. False. They they um they allow us to get energy from other nutrients. I've said that several times now. Here you see what a coenzyme is. So the enzyme is that orange, orangish, yellowish, orangish thing. That's going to be the protein. But the the ignition that turns on the enzyme is going to be uh, going to be the vitamins. So enzymes are worthless without without vitamins or or minerals to power them. So these are called coenzymes. If this if this was a mineral, it'd be called a cofactor. But we'll come back to that in a couple chapters. All right. Let's get started. So here we have we have thiamine first, which is uh, vitamin B one. 
So it's part of the coenzyme thiamine pyrophosphate, which is a very important enzyme for energy metabolism. So you see here that thiamine is needed to convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So without thiamine, basically your, your, your metabolism, your glucose metabolism would shut off because glycolysis turns glucose into, into pyruvate, and then pyruvate needs to become acetyl-CoA to run through the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. Uh, thiamine is also needed for nerve and muscle function. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be a big deal there. Uh, what else do I have? So critical functions and energy production supports pro proper heart function. I have some I have some foods we'll come back to. But a deficiency, what you see here, what this child has is something called berry berry, and it's you see that edema. That's a, that, that's basically a thumbprint that just stayed stuck uh, in that um, in in the foot there. Um, what's the FDA page say? So the conversion of food into energy, nervous system function. We've said all that. All right. As far as uh, let's see here. We'll, I'll show you the thiamine in food. I just want to make sure I'm getting... All right, average intake meets or exceeds recommendations. So this is something that's very important. I like to focus on the vitamins and minerals that we struggle to get. The ones that almost everyone gets, we don't need to, we don't need to spend as much time talking about. But you see here for thiamine, um, the, the recommended dietary intake is 1.5 milligrams, but getting there is very easy. I have a few... You see here a list of food sources. You can look at this, but I'm going to give you the ones that I have. Uh, many quality sources throughout the food groups, including organ meats, pork, and whole grains. Asparagus and Brussels sprouts are good examples. Uh, and then on the, uh, the FDA site, beans and peas, enriched grain products like breads and cereals. Nuts, pork, sunflower seeds, and whole grains. So lots and lots of good examples there. And then I love this these charts here in the book because you can see uh, it's actually showing you the... Uh, the thiamine amounts in all these different foods. So they're all over the place. Then I like how it gives you these excellent and sometimes unusual sources. So just so you know, like if you're not getting enough thiamine and you're really worried about it, then look at this list and find the longest bars and try to consume them. So you see pork is just off the charts compared to other uh, other flesh. I'm not, not sure why. Uh, and then you see soy milk and acorn squash being other really good examples there. All right, so that is thiamine. They don't talk too much about that one, but berry berry being that important um, nutrient deficiency. Next, we have riboflavin. So this is going to be vitamin B2. It serves, this is one we have talked about, serves as a coenzyme in energy metabolism. So flavin mononucleotide, or FMN, and then flavin adenine dinucleotide. This is the one we've talked about. So you see here that FAD becomes FADH2. That's one of the two electron carriers we talked about in our metabolism. Remember those casino chips. F each FADH2 harvests electrons and hydrogens enough to make two ATP in the electron transport chain. So riboflavin is a, is a big part of, of your energy metabolism. Um, the name too, flavin, it actually talks about the color. So <clears throat> just an interesting fact, excuse me. <clears throat> This is um this this is the one like if you take a multivitamin and then you wonder why your your pee is glowing in the dark it's basically riboflavin it's actually named after the fact of how it, how much it changes your your urine color when you consume it okay uh, let's see recommendations I'll come back to them deficiencies cause inflammation of membranes you can see like some inflammation in the mucous membranes of the mouth things like that there is no toxicity because again being a water soluble vitamin you would just pee out the excess and it makes your urine pretty I guess. So what else do I have here? Uh, for riboflavin, vitamin B2, critical functions in energy production, protects cells from oxidative damage, which is which is a good thing. It keeps your DNA from being damaged. Uh, it is light sensitive. So we'll come back to the food sources, but um, this is the main reason why, I think it actually says it's coming up, but this is why you don't see a lot of milk in clear glass containers anymore because uh, uh, UV light and light can destroy riboflavin. So you are better off buying your milk in, in containers that are dark. Like you see like the... Um, the white milk jug, jug instead of the clear milk jug, there will be a difference in riboflavin intake there or content. All right, so the sources I have, and then we'll look at the ones the book have. Milk, meat, and organ meats are all good sources. Spinach, eggs, and broccoli are good as well. Then the FDA site, um, riboflavin, conversion of food into energy, growth and development, and red blood cell formation. Uh, you need 1.7 milligrams per day. And the list of food sources, eggs, enriched grain products, meats, milk, mushrooms, poultry, seafood, like oysters, and spinach. Uh, which of the following is not true about riboflavin? That would be that it is destroyed by cooking. It's not destroyed by cooking. It's destroyed by the light. And that's what I talked about with the milk containers. So here you see some this, some more examples from the book. Notice liver is off the charts. Like I, I, I'm not, I, you know, liver is the, the most nutrient-dense food on the planet. You know, a, a liver from a healthy animal, like a 
organic grass-fed beef liver or something like that. Just extremely nutritious, so nutritious that I that I put a cap on how much I recommend people eat. You know, I, I mean, I think it's I think everyone should. And you probably don't, but I think everyone should. But um, you should not eat too much of it because you you see here one one serving of uh, liver would meet all your needs. But when you see that though, just remember that you need to be eating it several times a day. So if you have liver with with your supper and you didn't get any riboflavin the rest of the day, that's not a good situation. But you're going to find it. Look at the list of foods; it's everywhere. All right, next we have niacin. So niacin is the first one that has a couple different forms. So niacin has two chemical structures, nicotinic acid and nicotinamide, which nicotinamide is the one that, uh, the, the major form of niacin in your blood. But the reason these forms are important is because of supplementation. You know, people, when you supplement with these, um, nicotinic acid is, would be one that it's um, more rapidly absorbed and utilized. So it can lead to some interesting things like skin flushing. But the nicotinamide is going to be like if you find a niacin that's a no flush niacin, it will have nicotinamide. But if there are concerns about niacin, it be it be too high of intake intake impact in the liver, um, and nicotinamide would be more likely to do that. But I'm not a, not 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 too concerned about that. Um, the the study only studies I've ever seen that have shown that uh, niacin can cause any issues with the liver. We're talking about levels ten times higher than even I would recommend as like a prescription dose, right? Ni there are prescription niacins that you can that you can use, um, and I and I think you'd have to go ten times past those doses before you'd have to, you're worried about damaging the liver. But again, not medical advice. Um, <clears throat> so what do we need niacin for? So two coenzyme forms that are power power our metabolic reactions, but the key one is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide NAD. So go back to we just said riboflavin, riboflavin forms that FADH2, which is part of your metabolism. Niacin is even more important because NAD forms the NADHs. And remember, when you're metabolizing uh, glucose, you generate 10 of these NADHs, and each one of them is worth 3 ATP. So the huge majority of the energy that your body produces is carried on NAD, which is built with ni niacin. So see, there it carries hydrogens and their electrons. And then we have NADP, which is the phosphate form, not near as important. Uh, so niacin recommendations. Um, the RDA is stated in what are called niacin equivalents, and I have that here for you. Um, so like 20, 20 milligrams would be would be the intake that the FDA recommends. Uh, as far as as far as functions, the F FDA page has cholesterol production, conversion of food into energy, digestion and nervous system function. So obviously very very important. Um, the body does manufacture niacin from tryptophan. So it occurs only after protein synthesis needs have been met. So you need to make sure you're getting ample protein because if your body needs tryptophan to build proteins, it's certainly not going to build niacin with it. So you need to have this excess in that kind of amino acid pool that they talk about. So if you don't get enough niacin, you see here the condition in the image. This is called pellagra or a niacin deficiency. Uh, it, 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 can, it, can, it can lead to death. You see here it caused deaths in the southern United States in the early 1900s until we started to fortify our food products and that, that was actually a very big deal. Um, niacin toxicity. So again, large doses uh, certainly can uh, lead to issues, but we're talking very, very large doses. All right. Niacin is less vulnerable to food preparation losses than other vitamins. Then here's the food sources they have. So I'll read the ones from, from my, my sources as well. Uh, so niacin, I said it's vitamin B3. We talked about the two forms. Good sources, meat, fish, asparagus, and organ meats. I mentioned that skin flushing can be kind of interesting. Um, I've done that before just on purpose. I used to work with a pharmacy where I, I would do their training, and I, and I took volunteers, and we took a high dose of niacin just to see what happened. What happened. One guy, I mean, his head looked like a cherry tomato. It, the skin flushing really hit him. We were just kind of having fun with it. But then I didn't think it bothered me at all. I, I go to the car after I, I was done. When they get in the car and they turn the air conditioner on, that contrast and temperature just boom immediately causes causes my skin to flush. And so I have felt it, and it's it's quite interesting. I had a roommate in college that uh, that also his cholesterol was high, and the doctor recommended niacin, which we'll, which we'll see here is called um, high dose niacin therapy is used to help decrease cardiovascular disease risk. It's called niaspan, but it should be done under a doctor's supervision due to the rare but potential risk of elevated liver enzymes. But my so my friend was doing this, and he would just sit there in the morning and just like his skin was crawling that was this kind of skin flushing effect but it did it was unbelievable he actually had a, a familial genetic condition a familial hypercholesterolemia and he was able to bring his cholesterol down without any other cholesterol medication he was able to bring his cholesterol down a few hundred points I, I was just I was shocked by it all right um so let's see here so the other food sources 
So beans, beef, enriched grain products, nuts, pork, poultry, seafood, and whole grains. Now you know you're going to notice that these food lists are really really similar. If you're eating these kinds of foods, that's why I said you don't have to worry much about nutrient deficiencies. If you're if you're if you're eating the foods that check all these boxes, at the end of the day, you should have enough of these nutrients. All right, next is biotin. So biotin, um, it's a coenzyme that carries activated carbon dioxide. So you need it for the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. It delivers carbon to pyruvate to form oxaloacetate, meaning that without biotin, the last step of the Krebs cycle can't start the first step of the Krebs cycle. I don't care if you know exactly where these are needed, but this is what I mean when I say they're needed to generate energy. Uh, biotin is also needed for gluconeogenesis, which is the conversion of non-carbohydrates into glucose and fatty acid synthesis. So you need biotin to, to break down your food, to make glucose, and to make fats. Also needed for the breakdown of fatty acids and amino acids. So you see it's everywhere, but it's widespread. So the reason, so it's critically important that you're getting enough biotin, but the reason we don't spend a ton of time talking about it is because it's everywhere. So uh, if you're eating food, um, you shouldn't you shouldn't have any real concerns here. So biotin is B7. I have critical functions in energy production. Also important in the synthesis of new fats in the body, which you saw here. Good sources include organ meats, beef, almonds, walnuts, and Swiss chard. My wife grows that, I love that. Um, let's see, what's the government site say? So energy production, protein, carbon, fat metabolism, we covered all that. Where is it found? Uh, oh, we need 300 micrograms of it a day. Where is it found? Avocados, cauliflower, eggs, fruits like raspberries, liver, pork, salmon, and whole grains. So no, no tolerable in, upper intake level, so you don't have to worry about toxicity and finding enough of it. Just eat food, you should be good. All right, uh, pantothenic acid. So part of the chemical structure of coenzyme A. So when you take, remember that, um, uh, for example, so acetyl-CoA, uh, pyruvate, you take that third carbon off, turn it into carbon dioxide, becomes a two carbon acetyl group. You add the CoA, which needs pantothenic acid, and now you have acetyl-CoA, which, which is the keystone of our entire metabolism. All right. I don't think I put this one on that list because it's just it's found in so many places. So uh, widespread in food, like I just mentioned. So it's functions, conversion of food into energy, fat metabolism, hormone production, nervous system function, and red blood cell formation. You need 10 milligrams of it a day. Uh, it is widespread in food, but it's readily destroyed by freezing, canning, and refining processes. Which, but it's but it's everywhere. So we're losing a chunk of it, but since it's everywhere, it's still not a big deal. Um, speaking of everywhere, where do we find it? Avocados, beans and peas, broccoli, eggs, milk, mushrooms, poultry, seafood, sweet potatoes, whole grains, and yogurt. So there's a long list there. Um, and again, they're not even showing you the list of foods because they're just everywhere, and that's why deficiency is so rare. Next, uh, vitamin B6. So I would say, you know, when I when I think of the B vitamins, like your folate and B12 are the and the niacin are the first three I think of, but B6 is a is a very important one as well. You see here we have three different forms of it: pyridoxal, pyridoxine, and pyridoxamine. Not a huge deal, but uh, to, okay. So conversion to the con con coenzyme PLP, which is needed for amino acid metabolism and carb and fatty acid metabolism. It's needed for the conversion of tryptophan to niacin or to serotonin. We covered that a few chapters ago. And it's needed for the synthesis of heme, so we, which we use in, in red blood cells, nucleic acids, and lecithin. So B6 is stored exclusively in muscle tissue, so kind of a neat, kind of a neat little um, side, side effect there. Uh, we don't talk about that one being stored very, very much, but um, so it's important for nerve health, muscle health, etc. Um, a note that I have here is that B6 helps prevent homocysteine from building up in the blood. So homocysteine is, it kind of like sludges your blood up. It's a real oversimplification, but it is an independent risk factor for heart disease. You do not want to have elevated homocysteine levels. If you do, B12, folate, and B6 are the treatment, right? There's no medical treatment needed, no prescription needed. More of these B vitamins can help your body um, get rid of this, this homocysteine. Don't even worry about what it is, but, but it's important. All right, um, where do you get it? I put organ meats, uh, fish like tuna, as well as chicken. Let's see what the FDA says here. Do, 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 do. All right, B6. You need two milligrams a day, so a very small amount. Needed for immune function, nervous system function, protein, carb, and fat metabolism, and red blood cell production. It's found in chickpeas in fruits other than citrus, so not citrus fruits, potatoes, salmon, and tuna. 
All right, so you see that um, alcohol can lead to B6 deficiencies because they impact its, its absorption. So generally speaking, alcoholics are a group of people that we consider to be at very high risk for B vitamin deficiencies because of absorption issues, but also uh, poor diet, etc. Uh, B6 toxicities can certainly uh, can lead to neurological problems. B6 is often used to, to, to treat some neurological problems. Maybe treat's a strong word, but uh, it's been linked to improvements in carpal tunnel syndrome and a few other things as well. All right, we talked about the food sources. Here you see here you see the list. You can just pause and take a look at those. Make sure you're eating. Basically, whenever we come to one of these slides, just pause it. Make sure you're eating you know enough of them to reach that RDA at the bare minimum. But so kind of add those bars together. Oh good, I'm eating those four foods. I'm getting way past that dot, dot, dotted red line. I'm moving on. All right, next we have folate. I guess I mentioned this was one of my one of my favorites. So uh, also known as folicin or folic acid. So it's a primary coenzyme form is called tetrahydrofolate. Uh, it transfers one carbon compounds during metabolism. So it converts B12 to its coenzyme form. It's needed to make DNA and that's a really big deal. And it also regenerates methionine from homocysteine. So I just mentioned that folate will help you get rid of homocysteine. It does so by regenerating it into methionine. But synthesizing DNA is gonna be the key here, right? This is why when you think of folate and folate intake, almost everyone thinks of preventing neural tube defects. So folate, very important early in pregnancy as the neural tube, which is where the spinal cord is going to be, uh, is developing in an infant. So the, you know, the first, uh, first six to, to seven weeks of during pregnancy, folate critically important for preventing neural tube defects. Neural tube defects used to be very common in the US until we started to fortify our grain products with folate. So now whenever you're eating enriched grain products, you will, um, you will, uh, uh, you'll be, you'll be getting hopefully enough folate to prevent these kind of problems. All right, so we'll come back to that. But before we get there with folate to see what the two sites say, folate slash folic acid, important for pregnant women and women, women capable of becoming pregnant. Absolutely agree with that. Prevention of pr birth defects, that's, that's a key reason to consume folate. Protein metabolism and red blood cell formation. And you see, we keep mentioning red blood cell formation. That's why B vitamin deficiencies can, can cause certain types of anemia. A folate deficiency would cause a macrocytic anemia. So same thing with B12. So basically you have an anemia where you have you're, you have too few red blood cells, but they're too big and they're not very good at carrying oxygen. I, I like to put it this way. The reason we have these big red blood cells is they're supposed to be dividing in two, but without these nutrients, you can't get proper cell division. Uh, uh, need 400 micrograms a day. If, you, you know, if you're pregnant or capable of becoming pregnant, you would double that number to 800. But uh, food intake, asparagus, avocado, beans and peas, enriched grain products like bread, cereal, pasta, and rice. Talked about the fortification program there. Um, green leafy vegetables like spinach and orange juice. Then on my sheet, I know I'm bouncing around a bit, but I wanna make sure I hit all these things. So folate, which is B9. Very important to note that folate and folic acid are not the same thing. Um, so you see that um, synthetic folate can be is is more bioavailable. There is there is a key difference there. So folate is a general term for a group of water soluble B, B vitamins, also known as B9. Um, folic acid refers to the oxidized synthetic compound that's used in supplement supplements and food fortification. Best food sources from from my list are beef liver and other organ meats, uh, pastured chicken, and leafy green vegetables. Very important in DNA production, cell division, and cell differentiation. So we talked about pre pre preparing the neural tube, etc. Uh, deficiencies cause elevated homocysteine levels, mentioned that, and neural tube defects in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. Okay, so here we see folate's absorption and activation. Um, not, not, a big deal, not a big deal here, but fo folate in our food. You have to you have to break you have to break it down and digest it like you do other things. And then you have to uh, activate the folate before it's ready to be used. More facts about folate: bioavailability ranges from 50 to 100 percent. Increased need during pregnancy. I talked about how we should double that intake from 400 to 800 micrograms a day during pregnancy. Uh, folate disposal, it's secreted by the liver into your bile. Remember that um, uh, bile is squirted into your gut to emulsify fats, but it's also a way your body can get rid of things. And then that, then that if you're eating a very low fiber diet, most of this is going to be reabsorbed again. But if not, some will be trapped and carried out. 
Neural tube defects, I've mentioned several times now. Um, supplement use during pregnancy, um, one month before conception through the first trimester. I think that's a really important thing. We always talk about if capable of becoming pregnant. We all know where babies come from. If you can become pregnant, you should already be consuming this. It's, it's worth it. You know, Take a prenatal vitamin if you could become pregnant because the problem is neural tube defects occur really early in pregnancy. And you might be, I mean, I've had students that say they didn't know they were pregnant for like nine or 10 weeks. Well, that's too late. So if you're capable of becoming pregnant, you should be doing these things already. All right. Um, so folate anemia, I just kind of mentioned this. If you're folate or B12 deficient, you, you're not going to get proper red blood cell division. So you're going to have two, you're going to have what's called a macrocytic anemia, macro meaning large. So you're, you'll have too few red blood cells, but they'll be, they'll be too big and they won't carry oxygen properly. So we covered all that. Uh, let's see, food sources, heat and oxidation destroy folate, same as most of your other vitamins. We talked about anemia, I think we're good there. All right, so folate food sources, I've mentioned a couple things, but you can look at this list here. Next we have B12. So we're almost done with the B vitamins here. Uh, so vitamin B12 and folate depend on each other for activation. So why is that important? That means that, um, sorry, I just gotta find it here. All right. They, they kind of can hide problems with one another. So a whole bunch of B12 can mask a folate deficiency. A whole bunch of folate can mask a B12 deficiency. The key is to get both of them together. I've really never recommended one without the other. Like if somebody, if, you, if you're having an anemia or you're having an issue and you're like, you're not sure if it's B12 or folate that's a culprit. Well, the simple solution is just to use a B complex or increase intake of both. But, uh, but they are needed. They're both needed for regeneration of methionine from homocysteine. So again, if you have homocysteine levels that are elevated in your blood, not medical advice, but I'd recommend getting folate, B12, and B6 for sure. And then also I recommend something called choline. But uh, again, not, not medical advice, just friends talking here. So B12 is needed for the synthesis of DNA and RNA. Which I mean, that's why you know you need uh, you, you need B12 to for proper cell division. Uh, all right, individual roles of B, vitamin B12. So on top of just the basic cell division stuff, B12 is needed for nerve function. So if you have a B12 deficiency, it can lead to some neurological problems. Um, digestion and absorption. This is a neat one because of something that happens in the stomach. So the stomach generates a compound called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor is needed for the proper digestion and absorption of B12. This is why I think if you were to tell me, like, if you, you know, without knowing what I know, well, if you were to tell me, name a nutrient that the typical American is not to worry about, I'd say B12. Right? It is in all animal products, which the average American consumes about 200 pounds of animal products a year. It is, you only need micrograms of it, which means a microgram is a thousandth of a milligram. Right, So we don't need a lot of it. It's in all animal products, which the typical American eats. And B12 is stored. Up to five years worth is stored in your liver. So if you were to tell me what's a nutrient that you'd never have to worry about, I think it's this one. But the problem is millions of Americans are not have low vitamin B12 levels in their body. And I think it's because of poor stomach health. I think that, um, you know, as we get older or we, or we eat poorly, our stomach doesn't function very well. We're having issues with intrinsic factor. We're having issues with digestion and absorption. This is why if you have a B12 deficiency, they might, they might try to treat it with a supplement, but most of the time they just go to injections, B12 injections. They bypass your GI tract altogether and just dump it into your bloodstream. So I think that most people, most Americans, and let, and let, again, unless you're a vegan and you're not finding these foods because they're in animal products, um, the typical American, if they're B12 deficient, it's because of gut issues more than intake issues. And that's why they use the B12 injections as a treatment. All right, so where do we get B12 food sources found almost exclusively in animal products? And that's because it really comes from microorganisms but that, that, the, that, that give the nutrients to animal products. But um, uh, you see things like so bioavailability issues. Um, but again, all animal products are going to have plenty of it. There's no toxicity level. Uh, let's see here. So B12 plays an important role in nerve health and DNA synthesis. We mentioned that. B12 is the only water cell vitamin that's stored in any large amount. So it's stored in the liver. Uh, it's necessary to have adequate stomach acid and a protein called intrinsic factor for proper absorption. I said that. Uh, B12 is found only in animal products unless food is fortified. So you can find foods that have B12 added. No problems there. Um, best food sources include organ meats uh, like beef liver and seafood. And then on this list here, we have dairy products, eggs, fortified cereals, meats, poultry, seafood like clams, trout, salmon, haddock, and tuna. And the intake needed is six micrograms a day, very small number. 
and deficiencies can cause neurological problems and elevated homocysteine levels. Choline, I just mentioned choline when we talked about um, uh, uh, talked about uh, homocysteine levels. So choline is 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 a vitamin-like substance, right? It's not so it's not like technically a vitamin, but it is essential, meaning we need to consume it. So so choline is an essential nutrient. It is commonly grouped with the B vitamins mainly because of its function. It's used to make lecithin and acetylcholine. Uh, which is a you know a neurotransmitter. So it's manufactured from methionine. So if you're if you're if you're um, that can that can impact homocysteine levels, and that's why choline intake is is linked to lowering homocysteine levels. It is a conditionally essential nutrient if you don't have enough methionine. Uh, and then adequate intake, we don't know how much, right? That that's kind of a trick tricky issue here. But uh, all right, so you won't. I got to jump ahead to my vitamin-like substances on this document here. I apologize for those of you just watching this on YouTube. You don't you don't have access to these these course resources. But uh, so choline I have here is not a true vitamin. It's a vitamin-like substance. Very important for fat slash cholesterol metabolism and transport. Important in homocysteine metabolism. So food sources include egg yolks, grass-fed butter, potatoes, and cauliflower. And this is an important one. Deficiencies can cause fat accumulation in the liver, possibly, again, possibly, like it says here, it's not fully understood, possibly leading to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I, I, if someone has fatty liver disease, which is becoming more and more of a problem, especially non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I definitely recommend getting more nutrient intake of all sorts of nutrients, but choline is really high up on that list. All right, just a few other things here. So these non-vitamins, just you know, other other kind of important things. But the, uh, we have it. Don't worry about these as much. But inositol is part of cell membranes. Carnitine is needed for. It's called the carnitine shuttle. It's needed to transport fatty acids into your into your mitochondria for oxidation and metabolism. Uh, PABA is para amino benzoic acid. Uh, bacteria need that a lot because they actually make folic acid out of it, but it doesn't matter to us as much. Uh, bioflavonoids, just the chemical, you know, the phytochemicals, chemical compounds that are found in our foods. That's why we don't eat individual nutrients; we eat foods, and and that's why we we try to we try to create supplements that that talk about oh here's a compound we know seems to be good from spinach. Let's just put that in a pill form. It doesn't work, right? When you eat spinach, you're consuming thousands of compounds that are working together. So spinach makes you healthier than any spinach extract supplement ever could, at least as far as we know now. All right. So interactions among the B vitamins, this is, I mean, the interactions are, are a huge deal, but uh, almost every nutrient in your body is going to have synergistic relationships, meaning that the two, two nutrients help each other and make them work better. But almost every nutrient is also going to have an antagonistic relationship too, which means that um, this nutrient will impair the absorption of this nutrient. And we'll see that a lot with minerals, like high intakes of one mineral decrease the absorption of others. So just there, there's there's constant interactions. If you if you put all the vitamins and minerals kind of on a chart and then put all the webs from the lines from where they connect, whether for good or bad reasons, it would look like a really messy spider web. All right, um, so interactions among the B vitamins. Each B vitamin coenzyme is involved in energy metabolism, both directly and indirectly. We talked about all that. Um, deficiencies. B vitamin deficiencies seldom show up in isolation because again, if you're if you're so malnourished that you have beriberi berry because you're not getting enough uh, thiamine, then you're probably deficient in other nutrients as well. And then pellagra being a, a niacin deficiency. Um, toxicity, very rare. Um, excess is eliminated through urine, so that's why it's very rare. Um, the main issues with toxicity would be with high, high doses with supplementation. All right, so those are all your B vitamins. Now we have vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Uh, ascorbic acid or vitamin C protects against oxidative damage. That's why it's an antioxidant. So it protects against free radical damage. It becomes something called dehydroascorbic acid, which readily accepts hydrogens to become ascorbic acid. Okay, so it functions as an antioxidant. I'll talk about the areas where I think it's most important, but it does defend, defend your body against free radicals. So what are those? Free radicals are these unstable creations in the body. They're unstable because they have an unpaired electron and they're only going to be happy if they go harvest an electron from somewhere. So they're, so you see they're a molecule with one or more unpaired electron. Well, oxidative damage, it's going to like, it's going to like be a little bullet that shoots through your cells trying to steal an electron. But once it does that, it creates this cascade effect because now wherever it stole an electron, 
there's now an unpaired electron and it's unhappy. So, so, these, um, so antioxidants function by neutralizing these free radicals, but just imagine them as bullets that shoot through your cells and do damage. They can damage your DNA, damage cell structures, etc. Um, so oxidative stress of free radicals may, and, and, and antioxidants may play a role in preventing diseases. There are, there's, there's a theory of aging called the free radical theory of aging, which basically says that we decay because of free accumulation of free radical damage. And if you consume antioxidants, then that should slow that damage. All right, describe the role of vitamin C and its relationship to oxidative stress and free radicals. I just kind of did. So free radicals are unstable and vitamin C can help neutralize them before um, they cause o more oxidative stress in the body. Uh, vitamin C loses electrons easily, allowing it to perform as an antioxidant, so giving that electron to these, these free radicals. Antioxidants are protective against free radicals. These are unstable molecules because they have one or more unpaired electrons. So I said all that. Vitamin C protects cells and tissues from these unstable molecules that can cause oxidative stress, which plays a role in disease development. All right, so vitamin C as a cofactor. So vitamin C is a cofactor in collagen formation. So collagen is like this web. Imagine like three ropes and kind of knotting it together or braiding it. Um, collagen is the most, you know, most numerous protein in your body, right? It makes up a ton of different um, parts of you. So you see here, it's like the back, uh, about 30% uh, of your bones are protein and it's collagen. So collagen is the, if you took all the proteins out of your body, collagen would be the biggest pile and you need vitamin C to make it. And that's why you look at um, scurvy, which is a vitamin C deficiency. Your, you know, your teeth fall out and wounds don't heal. It's because of the collagen issue. Without vitamin C, you can't build collagen. Without collagen, you can't build a human. All right, so it's a cofactor in collagen formation, matrix for bone and tooth formation, a conversion of something called proline to hydroxyproline. It's also a cofactor in other reactions. So it's not the only thing vitamin C does, but it's the reason that the, the most serious one. Um, hydroxylation of car carnitine. We just talked about car carnitine being needed to, to break down fat or to metabolize fats. The conversion of tryptophan to serotonin, conversion of tyrosine to norepinephrine or noradrenaline, and, and for making hormones. So vitamin C has lots and lots of functions uh, and we need it, but the collagen one is the big one. Other roles of vitamin C. Uh, prevention and treatment of the common cold. Again, I think this is true. A slight but consistent shortening of cold duration. So I don't think vitamin C is a miracle. I don't think anything is when you're when you're fighting an infection. But there are things that can help you fight it off a little faster. Vitamin C also deactivates histamine. So if you have allergy issues, maybe vitamin C could be something beneficial for you to get a little more in your diet. Um, disease prevention and treatment roles being studied again. I mean, you see there are lots of studies done on very high doses of vitamin C and using vitamin C for all sorts of different things, but the jury's still out. Um, stress does increase vitamin C needs because the adrenal glands release vitamin C and hormones into the blood. So the adrenal glands are where a lot of your vitamin C is concentrated. And this is why like our ancestors that ate nose to tail, they knew how important it was to eat the adrenal glands because that was a good place to get vitamin C when you couldn't be consuming plant products. Maybe you live in live in an Arctic climate in the middle of winter or something. Um, what else about stress and vitamin C? Smoking increases the need for vitamin C. We had, so let, let me read a couple things that I have here. So deficiency causes scurvy, I mentioned that. Um, they basically figured that out with, uh, with pi uh, pi not pirates, but with sailors in the, in the British Navy. They say that up to a million sailors would have died of this before they figured it out. But they'd go out for months at a time on these boats. They'd be eating like you know salted meat and, and, and beer, basically and they'd be getting scurvy and dying. They'd be going months at a time without any vitamin C. And they and they they fix this issue by consuming citrus fruits, maybe maybe adding uh, lime to their beer or these types of things. So that's why. So it was actually epidemiological work looking at these sailors that had very restrictive diets that led to the understanding that scurvy is a vitamin C deficiency. All right. Deficiency causes scurvy. It has many important functions, but the most important roles are its antioxidant properties and its role in collagen synthesis. Protects lung tissue and white blood cells from free radical damage. That's why it's so it helps with immunity and lung function. Uh, dietary intake enhances iron absorption, which can be a good or bad thing. So it's usually good. So vitamin, if your iron levels are low, then consuming iron-rich foods with vitamin C will increase your absorption. So that's normally good. But if you have hemochromatosis or your iron levels are too high, then you would want to limit iron intake, but also limit vitamin C intake because it increases absorption. So it's so that's what I mean when I say it can be good or bad. Uh, vitamin C regenerates vitamin E. So this is a really good relationship. These two nutrients, they're both antioxidants and they work together because they uh, vitamin C can regenerate vitamin E. So vitamin E can go back out and do its job again. 
Smokers require more than the average person. Uh, good food sources include peppers, especially red peppers. So red peppers have two or three times more vitamin C than green peppers. Strawberries, broccoli, papaya, and pineapple. And then vitamin C is, is very sensitive to heat, light, and oxidation. Let's see what the FDA page has for us here. Vitamin C, antioxidant, collagen and connective tissue formation, immune function, and wound healing. Uh, need 60 milligrams a day. And if you were a smoker, you'd want to bump that up. Uh, where is it found? Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cantaloupe, citrus fruits and juices, like oranges and grapefruit, kiwi fruit, peppers, strawberries, tomatoes, and tomato juice. Vitamin C deficiency, we talked about the scurvy already. Notable signs of deficiency, the gums bleed easily around the teeth, uh, and then capillaries under the skin break spontaneously. So see these pinpoint hemorrhages there on the right, and then what's called the scorbutic gums. Um, that's because without collagen, these tissues are breaking down too easily, like the, like the lining of your blood vessels. So scurvy, talked about it. Sudden death, death from massive internal bleeding. You know, hopefully you never see anyone with scurvy, but it used to be a very serious problem, especially, especially with sailors. All right, vitamin C toxicity. This would really come from just supplementation. So we talked about diarrhea and GI distress. I mentioned this earlier. You basically, if you want to know what your the tolerable level of vitamin C intake for you would be, you increase your intake until you have GI problems, then you back off. Don't do that. I'm telling you that people, some people believe in mega dosing on nutrients like this. I am not one of them, but I'm just that's you. You can consume so much of this that it can lead to diarrhea and GI distress. So don't do that. I generally recommend just some, some studies I've seen on blood vessel health, et cetera. I recommend never going above this again, you know, it's my, my thoughts, but I recommend definitely not consuming more than three grams or 3000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. There's no reason for that much either, but that's where you start. Some studies have shown some blood vessel issues. All right, um, interference with medical regimens, high doses not recommended with certain medical conditions. Uh, the big, big one to me being that hemochromatosis. If you have too much iron, then you, do not want to be increasing iron absorption. All right, so vitamin C in food, I've already read off a couple of lists there. You can pause this and take a look, but you'll see that it's not uh, not too difficult to get enough of it as long as you're eating some uh, eating healthy foods. All right, we did it. Now that the lesson is over, you should have learned to describe how vitamins differ from the energy nutrients. We did that. Uh, they're needed to, to generate energy, but they don't generate the energy themselves. And then how fat cell vitamins differ from water cell vitamins. We talked about absorption, storage, excretion, etc. Identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for each of the B vitamins. Did that. Identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for vitamin C. So a lot of stuff here. Um, okay, so if you're, if you're in my classes, you know, look at the course shell and you'll have these documents to read along with this as well. So I do hope this helps. We'll come back and cover the fat cyber vitamins in the next video. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.